All right, cool guys. Welcome back to another episode of the State of E-Commerce. This week we have Yoni Kinski of Escala and Multiply Me. Joining us, Yoni, how's it going? TJ, thanks for having me on. And Ben, always pleasure seeing both of your faces. <laughs> of course. So this week, Yoni's going to take us through his company, Escala, what they're doing, how it can help your business and, and kind of, you know, businesses in the Amazon sphere and then also businesses in general in terms of scaling and you know, making sure you have the right headcount, the right financials, the right tools, the right data. Uh, so Yoni has quite a bit of info to, to walk us through, but I think Yoni, it would be helpful for you to put in your own words, you know, what, what is your company? What are you guys doing? Yeah, for sure. So we as a, as a business or as a group of businesses, our whole mission is how do we help support the e-commerce, Amazon, and effectively SaaS community in, in scaling their operations. So on the Multiply Me side, it's staffing. We do end-to-end executive search and HR funked into the Philippines. And Scala, we have a, a growing team, management consultants, all X, big four, helping build process improvement for the same business. So our whole objective is how we look at the process, how do we have systems and how do we uh, fix what's broken or plan for rapid growth in the organization from process efficiencies, process efficiencies all the way through to the technology used and the personnel need to operate that technology. So I think preparing for rapid growth in the e-commerce or, or Amazon space is, you know, top of mind. Uh, if people have not gone through it, you know, it's right place, right time. So I think we have a couple of slides here. So let's jump in. I'll share my screen and kind of hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, my friend. All right, cool. Let's jump in. So I gave you a little bit about uh, who we are. Um, awesome to be back chatting with you guys at Payne. But um, just to give you a little bit of, of a little bit more credibility. I'm also, and us as a foundation of the business, we're Exxon sellers. That business was acquired by one of the big roll-ups. So what we learned in that experience led us to Escala and building our own maturity framework and methodology around the space. So, um, you know, I might sound smart, but trust me, my team are the ones driving uh, everything forward. So they're, they're the critical thinkers and they're the people that you should really be speaking to. So for a lot of you guys out there, especially if you're in the e-commerce and Amazon space and you have peak season, um, it can be pretty hectic, uh, particularly, you know, when you, you talk about Christmas or Q4, um, you know, it's one of my favorite little uh, gifts, but, it, you know, everything is not fine. Things are super stressful and it's really just about keeping your head above high water. And so the whole idea of this presentation and the information that I'm here to share as much as I'd love to talk about us as a business, it's more about you understanding where you sit in the ecosystem in terms of um, you as a business operator and steps that you can take with or without us to getting yourself into a better position, whether it's working less hours or a better financial position, whatever is your motivating factor, this is really what we're here to talk about today. So before I jump into explaining scale, um, I think it's really important that you understand where you sit, like I was saying, in whether it's in or on your business. And it's a very subtle difference, but that subtle difference can entirely change the way in which you look at, at your operation. So working in your business, what does that actually mean? So for people working in their business, the focus is often very much on the short-term deliveries. What, what am I, what am I doing today? You know, dealing with the very urgent priorities. If we use Amazon as the example, stepping into Seller Central, seeing the flag go off, all of a sudden, everything you planned around your PPC reporting and shifts and changes to inventory goes out the window, and you're trying to deal with some sort of a claim lost in the abyss. Um, your focus really becomes on no process related to the team, but really just micromanagement of them, telling them what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, I think it's becoming pretty clear that that's not a scalable solution. Where, where you really want to get to is working on your business. So when you can get to a point where you can focus your attention on that long-term growth strategy and you deal with important tasks, building systems to enable scale and having very intelligently defined roles so that there's no crossover, that's when you build true trust and that's how you can really attack scale and you become ready for it. 
So just to harp on it a little more, just so you can get that framework or your head around, you know, is this me? Am I working in my business or am I working on it? Um, and, and some of the things to avoid, you know, when we look at people who are working in their business, um, it's, it's very much high risk, right? Um, it's depending on your size. If you've got a small team and nothing's documented, everything results on the influence and perspective of key personnel in the business. And rather than doing things like driving the standards across the business and empowering leadership to make good decisions, to create, you know, the actualization of the reality that you want to live. Um, you know, if one person leaves or if you don't turn up to work, all of a sudden, you know, you're in a very different predicament. So, you know, this whole notion of what we're going to share today is, is how do you actually get there? So before I scare anyone, um, what I think it's important is that it, this is common for most business owners. You'll effectively build an early concept. So let's say using Amazon again, you have a great product idea. You've done the keyword research. You've gone to market. You're starting to build the framework and you're making sales and the concepts there, you've got your first 50 reviews or 10 reviews, whatever it might be. And all of a sudden, you know, the little flag goes off and you're stuck with an urgent task. And next thing you know, PPC has gone out the window and that's another urgent task. And it just keeps kind of rolling like that. And that is not uncommon for a lot of people. What a healthy growth trajectory looks like is once you have that early concept and you're at proof of concept and you've hit those reviews, you actually, you start to do the preparation work to scale the business. So when we look at healthy growth trajectories before we even start to truly scale, um, I think it's also important while we're in the theme of not scaring people is that people at the core of every business so humans need to be the driving force at the start. And that's why you're seeing the tipping point here becomes exponential. So once you have that proof of concept and you start to build the systems, systems is what is going to drive the true uh, exponential growth around that business. So I love to play this game uh, with a lot of people that I speak to. But if you ask yourself, if I was to step away from my aspect of business or my business, how long would it actually function normally? And because I'm not going to get answers from you guys at home, I'm just going to tell you that if it's, if it's one week, um, you, you're in a pretty good position. If you can pack up and go on holiday for a week and turn your emails off, you know, kudos to you. That's really good. If you're hitting two plus weeks, that's super strong. And that, you know, to us would be, you know, as a baseline is something that you would consider either a scalable function or a scalable operation. If it's anything less than one week and you cannot get away from your computer because we're living in the digital age and that's really where how most of us are doing what we do, uh, then you should probably start planning to figure out how you can fix that. So all of this is, is a keen focus on how we can have the most important people working on the most important things, not the most urgent. So before I, before I dive into this, where we're going to walk through today is how do you actually approach scale? So we've got four, I'm not going to call them easy steps, but four key steps and stages that will help you start to understand in how you can unlock what is, you know, your unique business genius into a effective scalable solution. And the first step here is we need to define and document, but I think that the most important quote that we have on any presentation deck that we deliver is that is this one is that if I had six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four hours sharpening my ax. And what that says to me is that everything in life and in business is about planning. Make sure you put in the time to put together the plan to actually get the objective or the results that you really hope to set out and achieve. So defining and documenting, what are we actually talking about here? So one of the things that comes up more often than not is the fact that when we ask people, you know, what happens in your business? What's the operation like? What sort of SOPs do you have? The first thing or, or you know, everyone is extremely confident. They've grown a business, you know, five, six, seven, eight, 10 million figures, whatever the business is doing. The reality is, you know, they've created something of value. People want to work with them, purchase their products, but when you ask them the question, they'll often say, I've got everything figured out, but it's all up here. It's all in my head. So the first things first is how do we, how do we commit that from what's in your head to on a piece of paper that will actually 
enable you to, to start the scaling process. So this is actually a high level process map of our business with a few things removed. Um, thank you design team for being overprotective. But um, what you see here is, is very much kind of the high level of each of the functions that, that, that happen inside of the multiply me staffing business and walking us through. So we've, we've, we've got an understanding at a high level as to what are the different stages. This is what we'd call like a stage one process map. Now, this also pertains to every aspect of things that happen inside of your business. So um, this is, for example, our HubSpot integration, again, overprotective team here. But the idea is that, you know, you commit the process and you figure it out before you implement it. Because if you don't do the planning beforehand, you're going to find yourself in a position where you might make one critical error and all of a sudden, all the hard work or the platform that you've chosen, you know, if you're not working with Payoneer, um, it, could be, it could be a mistake and you could have to re-educate your entire team and that costs a lot of money, a lot of time and a lot of energy. So design and improve, that's the next step. So once you have the high level defined, you really want to get into the nitty gritty aspects of it. You, you know, for us, we talk about stages two, three, four and five into where we get to with our clients, but Design and improve. So what does that even mean? Designing and improving is where you actually start to look at the next layer down. So using us as an example, again, we then go into the next stage and we look at the different, you can see the swim lanes here, where each person is defined in what their action is in the business and the, the piece of technology that they're using so that we start to get a pretty good picture as to what people do we need in the business? What actions do they need to perform? And you know, what's some of the more granular details that happen? And going back to the piece of technology, this is, I believe, for HubSpot that we use. You know, we start to really plan out every every trigger, every action, every element that happens inside of it, so that nothing is left to question. And you know, if any key people leave our business, um, and I love everyone that I work with, but you know, you don't want to be beholden to the fact that you know when I talked about before being perspective and you know the dangers that exist like if someone holds all the keys to what is your most valuable asset that's a risk that at least for me i don't want to be open to or susceptible to so this is one surefire way to start to not only remove yourself but create um, and solidify kind of the ownership of you owning your business processes so price's law sums it up really uh well and Bear with me for a second because it's a little bit of a tough one to, to totally uh, understand. But value creation is asymmetrical. So 10% of the team contribute uh, contribution equates to 50% of the valuable output. So to, to kind of break that down more simply, if I had 25 salespeople working in the team, five of them would be responsible for 50% of the sales output. So what this tells me is that if we can document, define, and start to understand and quantify the KPIs and expectations around personnel, we're not going to have to go to the level of hiring 25 people. Maybe we can reduce that significantly and actually have value creation as a more focused approach. And this is how we can affect scale. Um, as much as my mission in business is about job creation, it's about creating the right jobs, not creating jobs for job's sake. There's no way you can grow that way, but it's not true scale. It's got to be efficient. So the next stage, once we talk about documentation, so you've got your documentation down, you've put what you've got in your head onto a piece of paper. You've gone to that next level and you've started to really detail each of the different actions and functions that happen inside of the business. And at this point, we've got a pretty good understanding of what's happening in the business. We understand exactly all the moving pieces. Um, now is the stage where we start to say, right, now that we've got the details that, and the devil is in the details here, now we want to start to enable other people to absorb that information. So this is where we talk about onboarding the right people and removing yourself from being the go-to person. You know, be the escalation plan, not the answer to every question. So how we do this and whether you work with expect expensive consultants or guys like us or anyone else, the reality is you don't really need to as a starting point, you know, for everyone at home, the idea here in this whole presentation and everything that we do is it's about value creation. How do we help people? How do we teach people how to fish? And so my words of advice here is that 
you're already going through these processes and systems every single day and doing simple things like when you do onboard that next person, record the session, record it like we're doing right now on a Zoom, on a Zoom call. Use things like Loom, put things into uh, process documentation, start to write it out, have your personnel that you bring on document out that process because the reality is you're doing all this work anyway. Don't double up on having to step back into the business every single time. Um, take the time, cut it up, make it digestible. And I promise you now, if you take these steps, your life will be forever changed in how you approach building a business. So structure for a saleable asset. And so how I'm defining a, a, a saleable asset, it's not necessarily that you want to sell your business. A saleable asset just means that you are now in a position where you, the owner of that business or key function or whatever it is, you're not beholden to it anymore. So if you want to sell it, if you want to take a two week vacation or you want to switch off for two months and fly down to Mexico, you can do whatever you want at this point. And that is what I would define as, as a saleable asset. So how we approach this as well is you want to also understand when we're going through the growth trajectory, who do I actually need to operate this business as it gets bigger? So this is, again, an overprotective team's approach to give me what I asked for. And that is the design of our org chart from this year and last year for the Multiply Me business. So you can see here that we actually plan out exactly who we need based on gearing ratios. So to give you guys a more tangible insight, like let's look at an Amazon business. Let's say you want to bring 30 products to market this year. And the reality is once you've already got 50 products in market and you've got a couple of designers on your team and you've got two copywriters, you know that as you bring on more products and there's going to be more listing optimization and more design creation and more you know, image changes, you're going to need more people to deliver. So build the right gearing ratios to understand well, what's my capacity planning look like? Who do I need? What sort of money do I need to be making in order to afford those people and build for that future state? Don't just wait around for it. So cash is king, my friends. Um, we cannot talk about anything and we're sitting here speaking on the state of e-commerce for Payoneer for a reason. You need to be in control of your cash and you need to have not only the right partners, but you need to have the right understanding of how much capital do I need to operate this business? You know, for anyone who's going through it, growth is the most expensive phase of any business and to hit that critical mass is tough. So I'd say whether you're bootstrapping or looking for investment, whatever that might look like, you really have to be in control of your finances. So I already, I've apologized enough times about the overprotectiveness of my team. But um, when we talk about finances and this is for an Amazon business, understanding inventory levels and the required investment to invest in that inventory, knowing also PPC can get wildly out of control very, very quickly if you don't have a plan on what you plan to spend every day, every week, every month, knowing the seasonalities around Christmas and you know the rowers that you get at different, you know, or the ACOS for Amazon speak, um, you need to be in control of what that looks like. And you need to have each of the metrics out. So this, if you could actually see it, it would show cash flow projections for an Amazon business over a two year period, including the number of products sold, you know, including things like the return rates and just about everything connected to it. Be in control of your finances. And lastly, and this is kind of Jedi status, I would say, is you know, um, great read for anyone still listening to me drone on, is um, is the Lean Startup. So the Lean Startup, they actually have another book called Lean Analytics, and inside of it, it talks about the business health metrics and building uh, your OMTMs, only metrics that matter, and your North Star metrics. So again, for us across our businesses, we have two metrics that matter. We are in a state of growth. And so all we want to understand is our growth and our efficiency. And if those numbers are healthy, then everything's good. We don't need to get into the devil of the detail of everything that's happening in the business. But if those numbers aren't where they should be, then what you'll see is one of these numbers or multiple boxes in this thing will light up. And that'll tell us that we've got a problem from lead to opportunity days. You know, we have a problem with our ability to fill roles. We will understand very quickly what the problem is and we can hone in and focus on fixing it. Um, you don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. And everything that I've spoken about today is about 
the fact that once you document, define and build for scale, you don't need to sit so deeply with inside your business. So um, guys, you might have some questions, but I am all done here. Thank you very much for having me. And I really hope that this has been uh, a valuable bit of information. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's, it's kind of one of those right time, right place conversations because, you know, the e-commerce world has seen sort of unprecedented growth in the last year, coupled with the emergence of all these roll up businesses, which, you know, you've obviously mentioned before, you know, as a business, you have to understand your value and your structure and make sure that if you are, you know, looking to figure out if I want an exit, um, how do I do that? What is my business worth? Am I doing things efficiently, cost effectively, etc., to to parlay that into to more money on my exit or or whatever it may be? If you want to go from a million dollar business to a ten million dollar business, you most likely can't keep doing what you're doing. You probably have to change things up, tweak people, tweak systems, um, and and this is really valuable stuff to do that or help do that. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, that's the idea really is, is how to, how do you look at it? And, you know, when we talk about the, the difference, yeah. Um, you know, I've heard, I've heard, I've read a few stats around that what COVID did to e-commerce has projected us about five years into the future of where they expected e-commerce to, to be at, um, which is a pretty, pretty daunting realization knowing that, you know, there is a lot of new money coming into the space and everyone, you know, it feels like a, a race, to get in as quickly as humanly possible. Um, I'll say, I don't feel like this is going anywhere. Um, you know, the next five, 10 years, you're going to be pretty good. So again, back to making, doing the planning that you need to make good decisions. But um, it's very different as well, running a million dollar business to a $5 million business to a gazillion dollar business. I don't know how big Payoneer is, but um, you know, the, 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 the reality is it's a, it's a shifting, um, landscape of challenges and being ready for each stage is, is always going to be key in making sure that you're actually successful in what you're doing. And, you know, talk about being ready for each stage of the next thing that's going to happen. I mean, I, I agree that I don't think e-commerce is going anywhere. I think that we're finally filling the shoes of the infrastructure that's, you know, been set before us, especially with, with consumer habits changing. Um, so, you know, to meet this consumer demand, what, what are some of the pitfalls that uh, brand owners will fall into as they're looking to automate or looking to scale and you know, potentially doing that too quickly? Yeah, great question. I would say there's, there's a few ways in which you could take a question like that. Um, the first is, um, A is, you know, I, I think when we talk, I speak to lots of people in business and you know, there's a lot of brilliant, brilliant people out there, um, but having, having an ego about thinking that the way you do something is the right way and the only way. I think that's probably one of the biggest pitfalls, I think, in business and in life too. You know, there's always room for knowledge and learning. And, you know, I mean, I've seen you boys on Clubhouse as well. It's been an incredible learning journey for the last however many weeks or months it's been. But um, being open to hearing other people's perspectives and really learning um, what that looks like, I would say is, is one area. Um, and that's at the core of everything. I would say that another area that would be like a, a pitfall is that rapid expansion is tough. And the notion of thinking that you can just simply bro, you know, branch out into doing things that are not your core business, as well as people that do, is a huge risk. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're not, if you're not uh, a logistics or supply chain specialist and you've been using a 3PL and you turn around and you say on a whim, you know what, how hard could it be? I'll just get myself a warehouse and I'll set this up and couldn't be that hard. If you, if you dive into things too quickly and you don't have the expertise, or you don't bring the expertise in house. I think that that is a, uh, that's a way that you can make some pretty, um, pretty big mistakes that would be hard to claw your way back from, you know, giving that example, yep. you know, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I think yeah. that certain businesses, you know, if they want to bootstrap, they say, I can do this all myself. I can shoulder this heavy lift. But, you know, in reality, when you're looking at a business, no matter how big or how small, whether it's, uh, you know, Payoneer or Escala or, you know, the, the individual brand owner on Amazon, 
they've built their business on multiple partnerships using multiple tools with great relationships out there in the industry. Um, all that being said is that exactly, you know, well, efficiency is the key for, for everyone. And I think that's a great goal that we strive for. It's the, the key pitfall is just not trying to burden and not trying to take on that burden yourself and shoulder the entire lift. A hundred percent. And just to kind of ladder up on your point there, Ben, um, picking the right partners is key as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've spoken a lot about the people and processes that exist, um, but having the right technology partners, because technology really is the future, that's, you know, what closes the loop around systems. So, you know, we've been working together for some time now and being able to leverage solutions like Payneer. And I mean, I could shout out a million other names um, that we work with right now in terms of technology partners that are getting kind of referred on in from inventory management to, you know, things like Helium, Tan and mm -hmm. Jungle Scout to So Stocked, uh, which is another inventory management system to, to kind of the whole landscape right now, pick the right technology partners because they've done the work and they've created efficiencies much greater than bringing on, you know, another person that's going to cost you X amount. If you can find those right tech partners, then that also, I would say is key to, to true scale. Awesome, Yoni. I really appreciate you joining us, uh, presenting through what you did. Uh, we are getting to the end of our time here. So what we want to do is, as always, give you the last word. And uh, whatever you want to talk about, whatever you think is insightful, funny, you can tell a joke, who knows, uh, but it's your place to, to say what you like. Jeez, put me on the spot here. Um, lucky I prepared something earlier. No, I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. Um, I'll say, I'll say that, you know, I've spoken a lot about planning um, a, a lot of the time here and I am a firm believer in it, you know, um, fail to plan and plan to fail. But <clears throat> to contradict myself, I'd also say that the most important part is to just get started. So build a plan, whether it's even, you know, a business model canvas. If you guys are familiar, it's the single page business plan that helps you understand what you're trying to create. Put something on paper, get it going, but but get in the game because the most daunting part around anything related to business is that first, where do I start? And so right. if I if I had one word of advice, it would be go go off and actually take it on with both hands and 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 start. Awesome. For Ben, for myself, Yoni, thank you so much. And we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys.